1834, frustration is at its peak. The Patriot control the assembly, but can exercise no real authority. They draw up a long list of grievances and demands, the 92 resolutions, and send it directly to the government in London. Resolved that this house is nowise disposed to admit the excellence of the present Constitution of Canada. They demand more power for the assembly and insist that the hated legislative council be elected by popular vote. We will not cease our demands for full political rights and powers. And though we feel uneasy, we hope that the British government will at last grant us justice. In this hope, we shall do nothing to hasten our separation from the mother country, unless it be to prepare and lead the people towards that day which will know neither monarchy nor aristocracy. United we stand! Divided we fall! The English party is up in arms too. John Molson, one of the most powerful businessmen in Montreal, issues a warning to the Patriot. Recent events have roused us to a sense of impending danger. The French party may yet be taught that the majority upon which they count for success will, in the hour of trial, prove a weak defense against the awakened energies of an insulted and oppressed people. Papineau's wife, Julie, describes an atmosphere of menace in Montreal. I harbor no idle fears, but I can appreciate for what they truly are, the rage and the hatred that this party bears towards us. I see that our situation is a lamentable one. They seek to prevail at all costs or trample us. And if we do not have the energy to escape from their power, they will certainly find ways of doing us harm. Disaffection is growing in Upper Canada as well. William Lyon Mackenzie has assembled around him the discontented of the colony. By 1835, he is a member of the assembly and mayor of the new municipality of Toronto. The population of the city has doubled in two years to over 9,000 inhabitants. Like Papineau, Mackenzie draws up a list of demands and sends it to London. The seventh report on grievances categorically condemns the system of colonial government. One great excellence of the English constitution consists in the limits it imposes on the will of a king by requiring responsible men to give effect to it. In Upper Canada, no such responsibility can exist. The Lieutenant Governor and the British Ministry hold in their hands the whole patronage of the province. They hold the sole domination of the country and leave the representative branch of the legislature powerless. In Halifax, the same battle is being fought. Joseph Howe is elected to the legislature in 1836. I am approaching now the root of all our evils that gross and palpable defect in our local government. Compared with the British Parliament, this house has absolutely no power. Howe also draws up a list of demands for political change. But he remains a moderate reformer. His loyalist roots prevent him from going as far as Papineau and Mackenzie. I know that I shall hear the cries of republicanism and danger to the Constitution. But the idea of republicanism, of independence, of severance from the mother country never crosses my mind. I wish to live and die a British subject, but not a Briton only in name. In London, the colonial secretary is inundated with demands for reform. But after three years of deliberation, Britain's leaders reject the 92 resolutions outright. 
They are convinced that self-government for their North American possessions would destroy the colonial system and gravely weaken the empire. The authorities in Lower Canada prepare for the worst. In 1837, events in Lower Canada take a fateful turn. For the Patriot, the rejection of the 92 resolutions is the final straw. They now carry the debate out of the assembly and move toward open defiance of the government. The first step is to organize massive public demonstrations. The protest movement reaches its climax that fall at the Six Counties Assembly. Five thousand people gather at Saint-Charles in the Richelieu Valley. They have come to hear the colony's greatest orator, Louis-Joseph Papineau. Concitoyens! Confrères d'une affliction commune, vous tous, de quelque origine, langue ou religion que vous soyez, à qui des lois égales et les droits de l'homme sont chers, nous vous sollicitons de prendre, par une organisation systématique, dans vos paroisses et vos townships respectifs, cette attitude qui seule peut vous attirer le respect pour vous-même et le succès de vos demandes. Papineau is emboldened by the groundswell of revolutionary fervor around him. He urges the Patriot to elect their own local officials, in effect to begin setting up an alternate government. Assemblez-vous! Élisez des magistrats pacificateurs, à l'exemple de vos frères réformistes des deux montagnes, pour protéger le peuple contre la vengeance de ses ennemis. Never before has Papineau gone so far. But for the most radical, it is not far enough. Dr. Wolfred Nelson of Saint-Denis, one of the English Canadians to join the Patriot, calls for armed insurrection. Eh bien, moi, je prétends que le temps est arrivé de faire fondre nos plats et nos cuillères en étain pour en faire des balles. Cyril Hector Côté, a doctor from Napierville, is even more blunt. Moi aussi, je prétends que le temps des discours est passé. C'est du plan qu'il faut envoyer maintenant à nos ennemis. In Montreal, the English party is mobilizing too. Peter McGill, president of the Bank of Montreal, speaks to a crowd of 4,000 people. We must admit the constitutional right to meet and discuss and to petition and remonstrate if they feel or fancy themselves aggrieved. But any and all of them who overstep the bounds prescribed by the laws in doing so, who outrage the feelings of loyal and well-disposed peaceable citizens by overt acts verging on rebellion, ought to be made to understand that such conduct can be no longer tolerated with impunity. The Bishop of Montreal urges the Patriot to stop before it is too late. Have you ever given serious thought to the horrors of civil war? Have you ever imagined the streams of blood flooding your streets and countrysides, and the spectacle of the innocent 
caught up with the guilty in the same awful web of disaster. Have you considered that, almost without exception, every popular revolution is a bloodthirsty act? In Upper Canada, Mackenzie gives up all his expectations of Great Britain. London's rejection of the demands of the Patriot is the final blow. People of Upper Canada, Canadians, fellow colonists, behold the oppressors! In order Inspired by the example of Lower Canada, Mackenzie begins mobilizing his own supporters. If the British Kingdom can tax the people of Lower Canada against their will, they will do so with you when you dare to be free. For weeks, Mackenzie travels the countryside north of Toronto. His message strikes a chord among discontented citizens. They've been demanding schools, roads, and bridges for years to no avail. Who would not have it said of him that as an Upper Canadian, he died in the cause of freedom? To die fighting for freedom is truly glorious! Would you live and die a slave? Never! Mackenzie is tireless, organizing more than a dozen public meetings and speaking at them all. Three cheers for Mr. Papineau and his gallant countrymen! Hip hip! Hooray! Hip hip! He wants to convince the government that the people want reform. And now I give you William Lyon Mackenzie! And that they support the Patriot in Lower Canada. People of Upper Canada! Bit by bit, Mackenzie edges closer to open rebellion. His supporters begin training with weapons. And the authorities are quick to sound the alarm. John McCauley, the Surveyor General, has little doubt where this will lead. In the rear of the town, the disaffected meet in squads with arms and are drilling, and I have no doubt they are in correspondence with the lower Canadian malcontents. The time may not be far distant when our muskets may again bear requisition, not in foreign, but civil war. The Papineau and Mackenzie faction seem almost infuriated, and I do not see how matters can end but in a resort to arms. But higher authorities believe the real threat is in Lower Canada, so the entire British garrison is sent there. By the late autumn of 1837, not one professional soldier remains in Toronto. now breaks out across Lower Canada. In the county of Two Mountains in the Richelieu Valley and in the region south of Montreal, Patriot harass and intimidate local officials who refuse to join them. The spreading violence convinces the British military commander, General John Colburn, that now is the time to act. The revolutionists are running over a large section of the country, armed and menacing every individual who hesitates to join them. If we neglect to profit by the offers from the upper province and those by the inhabitants of Montreal to assist by raising cause, 
while we permit the declared revolutionists to arm quietly, we shall lose the province. In Montreal, the arrival of soldiers from the neighboring colonies heightens the tension. The Patriot leaders retreat to their strongholds, Saint-Benoit and Saint-Eustache in the county of Two Mountains, or Saint-Denis and Saint-Charles in the Richelieu Valley. Among them, Louis-Joseph Papineau. Arrest warrants for high treason are issued against them all. The civil authorities have called for the military to assist them in apprehending these persons. It is of the greatest importance to drag the leaders of the revolt from their meeting places. General Colburn orders troops into the Richelieu Valley. He wants to strike first before the insurgents can mount a serious military threat. A few miles outside Saint-Denis, the first contingent arrives at dawn. The troops have been marching all night. Daniel Lysons is a lieutenant in the 1st Regiment of Foot, the Royal Scots. It soon became evident that the rebels were on the alert. The church bells were heard in the distance ringing the alarm, and parties of skirmishers appeared on a left flank. November 23rd, 1837. The die is cast. At Saint-Denis, 300 British soldiers confront 800 Patriot. About a hundred of the rebels have taken up positions in front of the Saint-Germain house on the main road to Sorel. Papineau and the other leaders have entrusted the defense of Saint-Denis to Dr. Wolfred Nelson. I told my companions that their lives were sought after and that they must sell them as dearly as they could. To be steady, take good aim, lose no powder, and all attend to their duty, their self-preservation. The battle lasts for six hours. But musket fire is not highly accurate, and there are relatively few victims. <laughs> Philippe Napoleon Pacot, a notary, is in the thick of the action. I don't know how many I killed, but I fired without remorse. It was not so much from a sentiment of insults and injustices, but the old instinct of traditional hatred of the races that awoke in us. We were fighting despotism, but it was above all the English that we loved to aim at. The stubborn resistance has taken the English by surprise, and their ammunition is running low. Finally, 
Colonel Charles Gore orders his men to retreat. Soldiers and 13 Patriot are dead. Louis Joseph Papineau is not at Saint Denis to celebrate the victory. Some will say that Wilfred Nelson ordered him to leave the village for his own safety. Others will accuse him of fleeing the battlefield. While his men celebrate, Nelson realizes they have taken a fateful step. We have now passed the Rubicon. Our very lives are at stake. There is no alternative. Even a mean, cringing submission will scarcely protect us from every kind of ignominy, insult, and injury. Worse to bear than death itself. If indeed this event do not befall us at once. We see now but the painful necessity of taking up arms in good earnest and manfully awaiting the occurrences which our attitude may provoke. General Colburn is shaken by the Patriot victory and makes an urgent appeal to the Lieutenant Governor of Upper Canada. The civil war has now commenced in this province. I entreat you, therefore, to call out the militia of Upper Canada and endeavour to send to Montreal as many corps as may be inclined to volunteer their services at this critical period. Political struggle has given way to armed rebellion. Saint-Denis is only the first in a series of bloody confrontations. The rebellion will spread all the way to Upper Canada. Hundreds of men will fall on the battlefields, and the fate of Canada hangs in the balance. In the autumn of 1837, armed conflict erupts after years of political struggle. At Saint-Denis, the Patriot win an unexpected victory. Encouraged by this, rebels in Upper Canada decide to march on Toronto. Would you live and die a slave? These men are desperate to win what they have dreamed of for years the right to govern themselves. November 25th, 1837. The British Army is determined to crush the Patriot resistance. The fate of the rebellion will be decided at Saint-Charles in the Richelieu Valley. Jean-Philippe Boucher-Belleville is one of the 250 rebels. We were on the defensive, there was no doubt about it. And for us, the whole question came down to this. Were we to yield up our property, our women and children, to a horde of barbarians without so much as a struggle? To barbarians who had come not to obey the law, but to plunder us by fire and sword and fill their own pockets. Charles Beauclerk is one of the officers in command of 425 British soldiers at Saint-Charles. Colonel Weatherall 
hoped that a display of his force would induce some defection among the infatuated people. But unfortunately for the sake of humanity, it was far otherwise. This gave rise to an order for the three center companies to fix bayonets and charge the works. Company! Britain's fiercest regiments close ranks and advance on the barricade. After two straight hours of continuous gunfire from both sides, the troops charged with bayonets. We had no weapons suitable for close range combat, and so we had to abandon the field to them. of the Patriots surrender. Lieutenant! Sir! Move your platoon forward and take care of the prisoners! But others refuse to admit defeat. of Saint-Charles ends in a bloodbath. 150 Patriot are killed and only seven British soldiers. News of the clash in the Richelieu Valley reaches Upper Canada. William Lyon Mackenzie is convinced the time is ripe to attack Toronto. In the absence of British troops, he hopes to seize power and form a provisional government. Most of Mackenzie's followers are disaffected farmers. He summons them to Montgomery's Tavern, a few miles north of Toronto. December 4th, only 150 men have answered Mackenzie's call. They are tired, famished, and poorly organized. Little Mac conducted himself like a crazy man all the time we're at Montgomery's. He went about storming and screaming like a lunatic, and many of us felt certain he was not in his right senses. Mackenzie's second-in-command is the surveyor and blacksmith, Samuel Lount. Now is the time that we'll have to go. There's no one waiting for us. Now's the time to go, I'm telling you. They argue late into the night, unable to agree on a plan of attack. The next day, Mackenzie and Lount decide to act. 20 militiamen, loyal to the British Crown, are waiting for them along Young Street. Colonel Lount and those in the front fired. Fire! And instead of stepping to one side to make room for those behind to fire, fell flat on their faces. The next rank did the same thing. Many of the country people, when they saw the riflemen falling down, and Heard the firing, they imagined that those that fell were killed by the enemy's fire and took to their heels. 
Stop! We can take the city where you're going! Come back! Stand your ground, man! Stand your ground! The city would have been ours. In an hour. Probably without firing a shot. <laughs> but 800 ran. And unfortunately, the wrong way. Queen, lad. 